It's great to be here. So nice to be here. I haven't been to a Porter Colloquium in a couple years, and it's a real treat. Um, I just want to salute the people who have been in contact with me now for months, working really hard. Teresia Bush, Melanie Harvey, Jacqueline Carmichael, Olivia Drake have all been incredibly, incredibly helpful, and I'm so happy to be here. Um, I actually had the great pleasure of being at Maryland last night and hearing the great talk by um, Dr. Leslie King Hammond on the Black Arts Movement. Um, and I was thinking, um, um, I was born, I don't know why I'm admitting this, but I think I need to, um, in 1966. So, you know, we're going to talk a lot about riots, rebellions, uprisings, unrest. Um, and in my city, in Cleveland, in the Huff District, the rebellions were in summer of 1966. And at that time, I was just beginning to take up space, a lot of it, in my mom's belly. Um, and I came out nine pounds, so she was in agony in many ways, I assume, that summer. Um, but so I'm going to speak today certainly not as somebody who uh, lived through. Uh, I was in utero during um, most of this, but as somebody who studies. So I thought, well, what can I do that's helpful? There's so many people in the audience that were participants and alive and vivid memories from life on the outside about this time. So what I'm going to do is actually talk about a public commission, the Kerner Commission. Because um, reading, I mean, I didn't read the whole thing again. It's like a door stop. It's like f over 400 pages. But um, thinking it through again, it seems very apt in talking not only about the black arts movement and black power, but today, too, um, coming off of what we've seen, you know, just including Ferguson and Baltimore. Baltimore, like about a year ago, right, from today. Um, so I'm going to talk, and then while I'm talking, I just brought a couple images, a little bit hard to see. Um, two are photographs on the left of Newark, summer 1967, um, and showing how the city had become a war zone between trapped blacks and a largely white police force. So the top photograph shows a military tank driving by the Army-Navy store while black youth look on from the sidewalk. And the bottom photograph also reveals fraught race relations. In this photograph, we see a white armed guardsman and a black man passing in opposite directions, both looking tensely in the direction of the street. And behind them, really hard to see, but maybe if you're in the front row, you can do it, um, is, is a shot through and boarded up flower store professing to sell the lowest priced orchids in town with the word soul spray painted in white around the broken glass. And then on the right, I have Faith Ringgold's um, great work from her American People series. It's the 1967 work U.S. postage stamp commemorating the advent of black power, 1967. And here she's offering many things, but one is a critique of the balance of power in the U.S. So she drew um, or painted 100 unique faces, and that was important to her that they were unique. And they crowd this 10 cent US postage stamp. 10 of the faces appear to depict people of African descent, which was approximating the percent of African Americans in the United States at the time. Um, and organized in a diagonal from bottom left to top right, the black and brown faces are paired with the top left to bottom right diagonal that reads black power, right? You can see that going top to bottom. And then what my students often um, struggle to see, it's one of those visual tricks, barely visible are the words white power. Do you see it? Harder to see than the black power because you have to turn your head and the letters are flipped on their side. So the W, right, is on the top right flipped. Yeah, I love the heads. I love seeing everyone flip their heads. So do you see it, the, how the W top right is flipped, OK? And that's hard. Ba that's the point. Barely visible are the words white power. Though elusive, they engulf the entire stamp, suggesting that whiteness as a power structure is nearly invisible, but overarching and ubiquitous. OK. On July 29, 1967, 
President Lyndon B. Johnson issued Executive Order 11365, establishing a National Advisory Commission on Civil Disorders to investigate the explosion of racial disorders in American cities. President Johnson's mandate for the 11-member appointed commission was to answer three crucial questions about the recent upsurge in urban violence. What happened? Why did it happen? And what can be done to prevent it from happening again? After conducting extensive field research, hearings, surveys, and interviews, the Bipartisan Commission published its detailed findings in a hefty government document known as the Kerner Reports in all the libraries, 425 pages. Apparently, 2 million people actually purchased it. Released on March 1, 1968, the 425-page report was informally named for the commission's chairman, Governor Otto Kerner of Illinois. Focused on 1967, the National Advisory Commission on Civil Disorders found that over 120 U.S. cities had reported disturbances in, quote, minority neighborhoods, especially in predominantly black communities during the first nine months of the year, the first nine months of 1967. Ranging from minor disturbances such as broken windows to major outbursts that included arson, looting, and sniping, these disturbances, which were typically fueled by real and perceived crimes of discriminatory or abusive police actions, reached a peak in July 1967. Newark and Detroit were the sites of the most explosive violence. After five days of unrest, 23 people had died in Newark. And after almost a week of unrest in Detroit, 43 people had been killed, most at the hands of police officers and National Guardsmen. In addition to the violent deaths, 600 people had been injured during the Michigan rioting, and fire had destroyed or badly damaged over 100 Detroit homes. The widely available 1968 Kerner Commission report opened with a dire warning about the current course of the nation. Quote, this is our basic conclusion. Our nation is moving toward two societies, one black, one white, separate and unequal, end quote. Explaining that poverty, prejudice, segregation, discrimination, and feelings of powerlessness were the underlying causes of the recent, quote, civil disorders, the commission saw the solution as the elimination of barriers to decent jobs, quality education, and affordable housing, calling for the, quote, enrichment of riot-battered central cities. It also stressed the need for increased integration of outlying metropolitan areas, expressing both a concern with the charge, quote, polarization of the races and a deep faith in the nation's founding ideals, the commission declared, and this is in their report, Discrimination and segregation have long permeated much of American life. They now threaten the future of every American. This deepening racial division is not inevitable. The movement apart can be reversed. Choice is still possible. Our principal task is to define that choice and to press for a national resolution. To pursue our present course will involve the continuing polarization of the American community and ultimately the destruction of basic democratic values. The alternative is not blind repression or capitulation to lawlessness. It is the realization of common opportunities for all within a single society. Recommending that America commit to national action on an unprecedented scale, end quote, by curbing unemployment and underemployment, eliminating de facto segregation in the public schools, reforming the welfare system, overcoming racial discrimination in federal housing programs, and making adequate living spaces accessible to those in need, the President's National Advisory Commission on Civil Disorders stressed their vision of a nation aligned with its ideals. Quote, it is time to make good the promises of American democracy to all citizens, end quote. Underlying the commission's sweeping recommendations was also the desire for a unified America. The major goal is the creation of a true union 
a single society and a single American identity, the report asserted. The backdrop for the Kerner Report and its urgent plea for increased integration and national unity was the loud call for black power, which had first been publicly proclaimed and embraced during the summer of 1966. Within earshot of the mainstream media, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee organizer Willie Ricks and SNCC Chairman Stokely Carmichael had unleashed the deep hunger of many African Americans for righteous militancy and collective self-determination with their explosive cry for black power. And I just want to reiterate, um, Dean Everett, that this um, story I'm telling you here, Howard is on every page. People connected with Howard on every single page. On the night of June 16, 1966, in Greenwood, Mississippi, during the volatile March Against Fear, Stokely Carmichael had given voice to this latent yearning in his fiery speech. And you might know this speech. Don't be afraid. Don't be ashamed. We want black power. We want black power. We want black power. That's right. That's what we want, black power. And we don't have to be ashamed of it. We have stayed here, and we've begged the president. We've begged the federal government. That's all we've been doing, begging, begging. It's time we stand up and take over, take over, end quote. Initiated by James Meredith, the man who had integrated the University of Mississippi in 1962, the March Against Fear was originally conceived of as a daring but small southward walk through Meredith's home state as a way to embolden black Mississippians following the 1965 passage of the Voting Rights Act to register to vote and in this way to participate in the political process. Yet after Meredith was shot and injured by a white sniper near Hernando, Mississippi, which is just across the border from, from Memphis, on June 6, 1966, the second day of his journey, prominent civil rights leaders arrived at the scene and resumed the march. This greatly expanded march took on a very different character from the original one, and it quickly became a site of charged ideological debate among major civil rights organizations. In direct conflict with the more moderate philosophies of the NAACP and the SCLC, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, SNCC and CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality, began pressing for more militant political strategies and social goals during the hot and heated walk from Memphis to Jackson. Challenging the notion that nonviolence was the only viable path to progressive change Rejecting the liberal understanding of integration as the ultimate social goal, critiquing capitalism, and doubting the efficacy of interracial alliances, many young black activists in SNCC and CORE, as well as in other activist groups, such as the emerging Black Panther Party, began to rethink the traditional tactics and visions of the black freedom struggle. Inspired by the late Malcolm X's call for collective self-definition, self-determination, self-reliance, self-respect, and self-defense, these resolute activists began to call for racial solidarity and black pride, independent black leadership, and freedom from white authority, and in some cases, armed defense and or struggle under the rubric of black power. Although the first bellows for black power came from the Deep South, the phrase and its array of connotations quickly capture the imagination of the urban North. On July 26, 1967, on the heels of the Newark riots and in the heat of the Detroit riots, H. Rapp Brown, Stokely Carmichael's successor as SNCC's chairman, employed the strident language of the new black militancy to assert the meaning of the uprisings igniting the American urban landscape. He declared the rebellions precursors to armed revolution. Um, and then this is just a little bit of Rachel trying with, with Stokely, with these were amazing orators, right? So I'm totally not doing justice to um, one of their um, aspects of their brilliance. We stand on the eve of a black revolution. Masses of our people are on the move, fighting the enemy tit for tat, responding to the counter-revolutionary violence with revolutionary violence, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, and a life for a life. These rebellions are but a dress rehearsal for a real revolution. Quote, unquote, it goes on and on. A stable and just society cannot mount a successful offensive action against a black youth who breaks the window and at the same time plead that is powerless to protect black youth 
who are being murdered because they seek to make American democracy a reality. Each time a black church is bombed or burned, it is an act of violence in our streets. Each time a black body is found in the swamps of Mississippi or Alabama, that is violence in our land. Each time black human rights workers are refused protection by the government, that is our anarchy. Each time a police officer shoots and kills a black teenager, that is urban crime. We see America for what it is and we recognize our course of action. H. Rat Brown, as well as other fierce advocates of black power, saw the recent unrest as political protest and believed urban rebellion would lead to black revolution. These activists viewed the revolts as climactic expressions of frustration, anger, and resolve, and sure signs that the black freedom struggle had shifted from a nonviolent struggle for equality, exemplified by the slogan, Freedom Now, to more militant tactics for political potency and autonomy implied by the Black Power rallying cry. On July 27, 1967, the day after H. Rep. Brown's dramatic foretelling, President Johnson delivered an address to the nation on what he called the, quote, civil disorders in flaming U.S. cities. Directly countering Brown's characterization of the rioters as emerging revolutionaries, the president insisted that the disorders were the work of, quote, criminals and were not in any way related to civil rights protests. The Kerner Commission, however, disagreed with President Johnson's characterization of the rioters, particularly his attempts to depoliticize them. In their report, the president's appointees claimed the rioters were, quote, informed about politics and that the largely young African-American male participants were, quote, more likely to be actively engaged in civil rights efforts, unquote, than their non-involved peers. The bipartisan committee, however, was far from aligned with the SNCC chairman's premonition of black revolution. For while they understood the rioters to be politically minded, they saw the riots as de desperate cries for inclusion in mainstream American society. Regarding their thoughts on the meaning of the riots, the commissioners wrote, quote, what the rioters appeared to be seeking was fuller participation in the social order and the material benefits employed, enjoyed by the majority of American citizens. Rather than rejecting the American system, they were anxious to obtain a place for themselves in it. By claiming that the message behind the unrest was, frust was a frustrated longing for inclusion, in America's capitalist democracy, and that the solution to the misplaced despair was increased integration, the Kerner Commission stood at dramatic odds with the militant advocates of black power. Although the brash phrase quickly became attached with numerous contradictory political strategies, from the development of black capitalism and the election of African-American politicians, to the ignition of a Marxist-inspired revolution and the creation of a new black nation, the collective yearnings lodged behind the fiery slogan were in direct conflict with the leanings of the liberal report. Whereas the appointed commission sought integration and national unity, black power activists typically advocated for black nationalism, particularly the strains of nationalist thought attributed to Malcolm X that stressed racial separatism, sovereignty, and revolution. Concerning the vital link between Malcolm X and black power, black arts movement founder Leroy Jones asserted in November 1966, nearly two years after Malcolm's murder, and this is Jones, quote, the concept of black power is natural after Malcolm. Malcolm's legacy was the concept and will toward political power in the world for the black man." End quote. Malcolm X and his legacy played pivotal roles in the growing racial consciousness and militancy of African Americans during the mid to late 1960s. Reflecting on the charismatic leader's brutal and confusing assassination in Harlem's Audubon Ballroom on February 21st, 1965, Larry Neal, the Black Arts Movement's key theorist and advocate wrote, this is Neal, but even though Malcolm's death, the manner of it, 
emotionally fractured young black radicals. There were two central facts that all factions of the movement came to understand. And they are that the struggle for black self-determination had entered a serious, more profound stage. And that for most of us, nonviolence as a viable technique of social change had died with Malcolm on the stage of the Audubon. Malcolm's ideas had touched all aspects of contemporary black nationalism. The relationship between black America and the third world, the development of a black cultural thrust, the right of oppressed peoples to self-defense and armed struggle, the necessity of maintaining a strong moral force in the black community, the building of autonomous black institutions, and finally, the need for a black theory of social change. So that's end quote of Larry Neal. Malcolm X's powerful contributions to contemporary black nationalism were sources of intense anxiety for the Kerner Commission. Defining the movement, quote, toward racial consciousness and solidarity reflected in the slogan black power as evidence of, quote, the frustrations of powerlessness the commission was quite wary of confident calls for racial pride and black unity. The wariness was perhaps based on the commission's primary data that linked tenets of black nationalism, namely racial consciousness and black solidarity and pride to unrest. For example, in an effort to assess the quote, racial attitudes of rioters in comparison to those who claimed to be uninvolved in the riots, Surveys in Detroit and Newark had asked both African-American participants and non-participants in the recent urban uprisings who they found, quote, nicer and, quote, more dependable, Negroes, quote, or whites, quote. When a much higher percentage of the self-reported riot participants than those who have purported not to have involved in the riots affirmed that indeed, quote, Negroes were nicer and more dependable than, quote, whites, the commission revealed its discomfort with its racial consciousness findings by quickly claiming that, quote, rioters have strong feelings of racial pride, if not superiority, end quote. Likewise, in an attempt to gauge the level of, quote, black consciousness of riot participants, a survey of African-American participants and non-participants in Newark asked each group what they preferred to be called, black, Negro, or colored, and found that the self-reported rioters, in line with the unapologetic new militancy, and somewhat in contrast to those uninvolved, preferred to be called black. The same uh, Newark survey also asked participants and non-participants if they agreed with the statement. Here's the statement. All Negroes should study African history and language, end quote. In line with Malcolm X's Pan-African emphasis on the study of the ancient continent and its diverse cultures, nearly 80% of self-reported riot participants vigorously affirmed the statement and reflecting the logic and reach of black na nationalism during the period, almost 70% of those purportedly uninvolved in the urban uprisings also agreed. With its faith in liberalism and capitalist democracy and its desire for national unity, the Kerner Commission feared black nationalism, especially its tenets that affirmatively claimed blackness emphasize the African origins of, quote, new world black identities, advocated pan-African political thinking, and fearlessly sought autonomy from white America. Although the commission had concluded that the nation was, quote, moving toward two societies, one black, one white, they saw this course as the problem, as exactly what needed to be reversed through wide reaching social programs and committed national will. The idea that African Americans in the United States could understand themselves as constituting a viable nation and a potentially glorious and righteous one at that fell beyond the commissioner's faith. It was precisely this ambitious vision, however, that lay at the core of the black arts movement. Concerning the links between black power, black arts, and nationhood, 
Larry Neal, the quintessential theorist of the cultural movement, explained in 1968. This is Neal. The black arts and the black power concepts both relate broadly to the Afro-Americans' desire for self-determination and nationhood. Both concepts are nationalistic. One is concerned with the relationship between art and politics, the other with the art of politics. Recently, these two movements have begun to merge. The political values inherent in the black power concept are now finding concrete expression in the aesthetics of Afro-American dramatists, poets, choreographers, musicians, and novelists. A main tenet of black power is the necessity for black people to define the world in their own terms. The black artist has made the same point in the context of aesthetics. The two movements postulate that there are, in fact, and in spirit, two Americas, one black, one white, end quote. Again, that was Larry Neal, 1968. Whereas the Kerner Commission lamented the creation of two societies, Larry Neal saw possibility in the split. For him, the black power call for political potency and autonomy was coupled with a related desire for artistic potency and autonomy. Neil firmly believed that the search for new political directions would be enabled by a search for new aesthetic directions. Dubbed spiritual leader of the black arts movement posthumously by Amiri Baraka, Larry Neal penned many of the movement's most passionate position papers. A poet, dramatist, essayist, and activist, Neal viewed the black arts movement as the cultural wing of the struggle for black nationhood. Inspired by Malcolm X's calls for self-definition, self-determination, and self-defense, Neal saw the arts as ripe terrain on which to graft lofty ideals, ideals that would enable black people to envision and force change. While he did not see the arts as capable of liberating black people on their own, he did believe that their ability to provide vision and cohesion made them a necessary component of a successful social revolution. In his 1969 Ebony Manifesto, Any Day Now, Black Art and Black Liberation, he explained, this is Neil, a culturalist revolution is a bullcrap tip. It means that in the process of making the revolution, we lose our vision. We lose the soft, undulating side of ourselves, those unknown beauties lurking rhythmically below the level of material needs. In short, a revolution without a culture would destroy the very thing that now unites us, the very thing we are trying to save along with our lives. Championing the expression of a black aesthetic that would ignite a black social cultural revolution, Larry Neal first pressed African American cultural workers to reconceive of their audience. In particular, he encouraged them to shift from creating, quote, protest art, which he saw as art that, and this is his quote, screams and masturbates for a white audience, to creating art that directly addressed black people. This shift, he prompted, would enable African-American artists to free themselves from, quote, white standards of judgment under which their work was usually deemed lacking. Neil also called for new aesthetic standards that would inspire and value art that reflected, quote, black realities, affirmed black culture, spoke to the masses of black people, and aligned itself with liberation struggles throughout the world. Finally, Neil insisted that this new art express what he defined as, quote, a vision of a liberated future. Of this last requisite, he explained, this is Neil, liberation is impossible if we fail to see ourselves in more positive terms. For without a change of vision, we are slaves to the oppressor's ideas and values, ideas and values that finally attack the very core of our existence. Therefore, we must see the world in terms of our own realities. In his initial charge to the National Advisory Commission on Civil Disorders, President Lyndon Johnson asked his appointees about the images created by the mainstream media and their impact. The question was, what effect do the mass media have on the riots? Johnson inquired of the commissioners. 
In its final report, the Kerner Commission placed heavy blame on the mainstream media for failing to communicate, quote, the causes and consequences of civil disorders and the underlying problems of race relations, end quote. Yet the commission was less troubled by the actual riot coverage than by their pervasive lack of coverage of the daily complexities of black life. And this is something where I do remember my childhood that there just was no imagery. Concerning this palpable lack, the report found that mainstream newspapers and television programming neglected both African-American subject matter and viewers. The report stated, quote, they have not shown understanding or appreciation of and had thus have not communicated a sense of Negro culture, thought, or history. Equally important, most newspaper articles and most television programming ignore the fact that an appreciable part of their audience is black. The world that television and newspapers offer to their black audience is almost totally white in both appearance and attitude. And that's the Kerner Commission report. In short, the commission criticized the mass media for exacerbating race relations by stating, quote, the communication media ironically have failed to communicate, end quote. Participants in the black arts movement, in a sense, wholly agreed with the Kerner Commission's heavy charge against the mainstream media for failing to illuminate black life. Two years before the report was released in 1966, Leroy Jones had characterized American television as, quote, a steady, deadly whiteness beaming forth, end quote. Black arts workers like Leroy Jones and Larry Neal, however, turned their spirited energies away from the mass media and mainstream society, for they held deep faith in art and the black community. Amidst bullets and flames, they took matters into their own mighty black hands and artistically fought to transform the cities of explosive unrest into sites of regenerative creativity. Thank you. <laughs>